Muy buenos días. Vamos a iniciar la serie de diálogos públicos privados para acelerar la creación de talento digital en la Alianza del Pacífico. Tenemos interpretación simultánea del inglés al español. Favor seleccionar en la barra inferior de la pantalla el icono del mundo. We have simultaneous interpretation from Spanish to English. Please select the world icon in the bottom of the bar of your screen, then select the language of your preference. Al momento de las preguntas, les pedimos usar el chat. Este será el espacio para que nos hagan llegar sus preguntas acompañadas de su nombre e email. Este es el segundo diálogo público-privado, Bootcamps, soluciones ágiles para acelerar y transformar talento. Vamos a dar la palabra al señor Alejandro Bubinich, director de Alianza Pacífico de la Subsecretaría de Relaciones Económicas Internacionales del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de Chile. Eh, gracias, Grace. Buenos días a, a todas y a todos. Eh, saludos desde Santiago, Chile. Eh, desde la presidencia pro tempore de la Alianza del Pacífico queremos dar la bienvenida a todas y todos los participantes de esta segunda versión de los diálogos públicos privados que tienen por objeto acelerar la creación de talento digital en nuestros países. Esta es enfocados en bootcamps. Los desafíos de la Cuarta Revolución Industrial eh, se han acelerado frente a los efectos de la pandemia del COVID-19. Pero al mismo tiempo eh, se han acrecentado las oportunidades que esta también genera. Y para aprovechar estas oportunidades, desde la Alianza del Pacífico resulta urgente que seamos capaces de abordar de manera integrada la disminución de las brechas digitales existentes en nuestros países con una visión programática considerando las necesidades que tiene hoy el sector privado. Al asumir la presidencia pro tempore, el presidente Piñera presentó a la Alianza una hoja de ruta que conformaba sus prioridades y eje estratégico para, para alcanzar la visión 2030 de este foro. Y el objetivo de lograr una alianza más integrada, mejor conectada, más global y más ciudadana, en este contexto establecimos como uno de nuestros ejes la implementación de acciones y mecanismos concretos que promuevan la creación de talento para poder enfrentar de mejor manera la cuarta revolución industrial. En un principio, este taller lo teníamos planificado de realizarse en la ciudad de Medellín, en el cuarto centro de revolución industrial, pero dada la crisis sanitaria que tuvimos, lo tuvimos que suspender. Sin embargo, hoy estamos más adaptados a este nuevo escenario global, e incluso estamos utilizando medios virtuales para desarrollar esta serie de talleres, con miras a implementar acciones asociadas a la aceleración de la digitalización de los procesos productivos y comerciales, así como la transformación digital es tanto a nivel de los gobiernos como de empresarios. Y además lleva esto a que tenga una cobertura aún más grande que los que podrían viajar a, a ese lugar. En una de las principales herramientas desde la, cual, desde la cual esperamos convertir estos desafíos en oportunidades es la, es la construcción de un mercado digital regional de la Alianza del Pacífico. Se trata de una herramienta que busca posibilitar el flujo de productos digitales, de bienes y servicios comercializados de manera digital y de capital vinculado al mercado digital entre los cuatro países. El mercado digital regional tiene por objetivo que las pymes puedan generar contenidos exportables entre los países de la PE, con la misma facilidad y rapidez como si lo hicieran dentro de su mismo país o ciudad. En otras palabras, buscamos expandir las oportunidades a través de la eliminación de las barreras digitales, promoviendo mayor uso de herramientas tecnológicas. En el marco de la implementación del mercado digital regional, este año esperamos lanzar una plataforma digital de la Alianza del Pacífico que nos permita aprovechar las potencialidades derivadas de la digitalización del comercio desde herramientas de vinculación empresarial, capacitación del, para la digitalización de las pymes y acceso a la información relevante para realizar negocios. Esta plataforma será un verdadero espacio de encuentro digital para diversos actores de nuestros países. Y en este contexto resulta esencial que redoblemos los esfuerzos a la hora de trabajar unidos para disminuir las brechas de habilidades digitales de nuestros conciudadanos. Solo así podremos construir un mercado digital regional robusto, capaz de transformar los desafíos en oportunidades y contribuir a que nuestras pymes y emprendedores puedan hacer un uso efectivo y beneficiarse de todas las herramientas de la industria 4.0 que está poniendo, nos, le estaríamos poniendo a su disposición. Debido a la relevancia de avanzar en esta materia, los países de la Alianza hemos solicitado el apoyo al BID para elaborar una hoja de ruta que nos permita 
es avanzar en la creación e implementación de iniciativas públicas como también privadas para acelerar el talento digital en la PEG. Y es en este marco de este trabajo que estamos reunidos hoy para conversar sobre bootcamps como herramientas para acelerar y transformar el talento digital. En este sentido, aprovecho de agradecer al Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo por su constante apoyo, como también al Centro de Cuarta Revolución Industrial de Medellín, quienes han sido aliados fundamentales en la organización de esta serie de diálogos públicos privados y talleres de trabajos virtuales, que tienen por objeto converger en un mejor entendimiento de la situación de cada país y de reales urgencias y desafíos en la materia. Cabe destacar que el objetivo final de estos diálogos, además de poder visibilizar las necesidades y prioridades del sector privado, es elaborar una hoja de ruta de talento digital para la Alianza del Pacífico, que puede incluir acciones específicas de políticas públicas e iniciativas empresariales orientadas a la creación, aceleración y sostenibilidad del talento digital en nuestros cuatro países. Estamos convencidos de que esta serie de diálogos virtuales públicos privados de talento digital, junto a la hoja de ruta que esperamos elaborar, contribuirán significativamente a nuestro propósito de construir la Alianza del Pacífico más integrada, más global, más conectada y más ciudadana. Muchas gracias, Luis. Gracias, eh, señor Bubinich. Continuaremos con la presentación, la metodología de los bootcamps a cargo del señor Juan Carlos Navarro, especialista líder del BIT. Muchas gracias, Grace. Eh, bueno, eh, agradecido a las inspiradoras palabras introductorias del señor Bubinich. Uh, y por supuesto, eh, un honor estar acá eh, a invitación de la Alianza del Pacífico y del Centro para la Cuarta Revolución Industrial en Medellín, Colombia. Eh, en el banco hemos uh, trabajado el tema eh, de cómo el cambio tecnológico está afectando a eh, la productividad, a las empresas eh, en América Latina. Y, eh, por supuesto, eh, digamos, no podíamos eh, dejar de reparar en el impacto que está teniendo eh, eh, esta cuarta revolución industrial, eh, lo que es el impacto de la tecnología digital. De manera que les voy a poner una presentación muy rápida, porque este es el inicio de todo, y a partir de allí eh, les trato de comunicarles de dónde venimos nosotros como Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y dónde creemos que podemos contribuir al desarrollo de América Latina y el Caribe con este tema. Voy a tratar de que se vea en la pantalla la eh, presentación. Un momento. Bueno, creo que la pueden ver. ¿La pueden ver, Grace? Sí, está todo muy bien. Perfecto. Bueno, eh, esto es una foto de una pequeña, no es gran cosa, una pequeña publicación que nosotros hicimos llamando la atención sobre este tema. Por supuesto que constatamos para empezar de que la economía mundial atraviesa una transición provocada por un cambio tecnológico acelerado. Eh, que esa revolución lleva a que en un lapso muy breve todo lo que se pueda digitalizar será digitalizado. Eh, y sobre todo que este es un fenómeno que va mucho más allá de la industria del software. Esto se solía discutir hace 10 años en términos de, bueno, y, y cómo tener una poderosa industria de software, cómo desarrollar el, so el sector de software. Hoy en día, eh, todo es software, ¿no? Y todas las empresas y todos los sectores en distintas, a distintos ritmos, distintas maneras, están siendo impactados por cambios muy profundos derivados del de desarrollo de tecnología digital. América Latina, por supuesto, es una parte de esta eh, transformación eh, y eh, difícilmente podía cumplir esta, digamos, eh, transformación a tiempo si no cuenta con las personas que hacen falta, los trabajadores debidamente calificados para hacer frente a este reto. Eh, América Latina tiene una cierta historia en las últimas décadas de llegar tarde a las revoluciones tecnológicas. Eh, llegó tarde, por ejemplo, a la revolución de los PCs, del computador personal. 
todavía hoy las cifras de computación personal en América Latina eh, lucen a primera vista cualquier estadística detrás de lo que eh, tienen los países, muy, pero muy atrás de lo que tienen los países líderes del mundo. Entonces la pregunta es, ¿cómo tratar de que esto no tome por sorpresa o de que no, a América Latina o de que no se pierda una oportunidad? Eh, las demandas de talento digital en América Latina, como en el resto del mundo, son muy grandes. Esto no es sorpresa para nadie. Eh, digamos, eh, hay simplemente algunas cifras, todas son astronómicas en términos de lo que es la demanda de profesionales, medio millón de profesionales según Cisco para eh, finales del año pasado, eh, 1.5 millones de desarrolladores de software necesarios para 2025 según un estudio del propio BID. Eh, y bueno, casi cualquier fuente que ustedes consulten les va a decir que eh, las Digamos, lo que tiene que ver eh, las ocupaciones que de alguna manera incorporan destrezas avanzadas digitales. No me refiero a cualquier destreza, no es la, no es la destreza de, de, de mandar un email o incluso hacer una pequeña página web, sino es de programar, eh, son, son muy grandes. De hecho, las encuestas a los empleadores confirman esto. Eh, cuando se le pregunta a las empresas en América Latina, como en el resto del mundo, cuál es la principal barrera que usted tiene para dar un salto de productividad para innovar, para sumarse a la transformación digital y el tema de la escasez de eh, capital humano eh, formado eh, como programadores, como desarrolladores, como analistas de datos, etc. Eh, aparece de primero, de segundo, pero siempre como uno de los grandes eh, temas. Aquí hay otra visión también del tema latinoamericano. Esto es un índice global que publicó Coursera eh, basado en información acerca de quién y toma sus cursos y qué cursos toma en diversas partes del mundo, muy reciente de este mismo año, y en ese eh, mapa del mundo acerca de Global Skills, Digital Skills, aparece América Latina entre emergente y rezagado, ¿no? una llamada de atención. Eh, un mensaje, digamos, de cómo banco nos afectó. Entonces, nosotros detectamos la existencia de una respuesta de mercado a esto. Es decir, eh, nosotros como banco trabajamos muchas veces como nuestro cliente principal son los gobiernos y estamos preocupados por la política pública, pero eh, lo que detectamos es que el mercado había estado respondiendo. Había estado eh, ocurriendo algo que había, era como la salida natural para tratar de eh, eh, llenar un poco este déficit de talento digital. Y ahí es donde nos decidimos a, a profundizar y un ver un poco más este, este tema. Y eh, publicamos esto, ¿no? después de un poco de, de investigación inicial, este paper sobre la disrupción del talento está disponible también en inglés, de, eh, Disruption of Talent. Y eh, la verdad ha sido muy bien acogido, si ustedes lo ponen simplemente en Google, aparece como, ponen disrupción del talento, aparece como la primera selección, y eh, Alison, mi coautora y yo, eh, identificamos el fenó un fenómeno conocido como, conocido como el de los bootcamps. Es decir, aparentemente habían aparecido estas nuevas maneras de educar a la gente en programación que se habían dado por llamar bootcamps, aludiendo con eso al carácter intensivo de la formación que se recibía allí. Y empezamos a ver cosas realmente que nos llamaron la atención. Entonces, básicamente, ¿qué es un bootcamp? Eh, es un acelerador de la adquisición de habilidades digitales. Es decir, usted puede estudiar la carrera de Ingeniería de Computación en la universidad y estar cinco años estudiándola, eh, o puede adquirirla en un bootcamp en un periodo que depende de cuál sea la duración de ese bootcamp, puede ser entre tres, cinco, seis, nueve meses, eh, eh, y ser muy competente en programación. Se trata de cursos intensivos, como ya dije, de duración intermedia, sobre todo con una metodología práctica, hands-on, es decir, se pone a la gente a trabajar de, con la computadora y a programar desde el minuto uno. Eh, en su mayoría, cuando hicimos esto, digamos, hace ya más de un año, eh, son presenciales, aunque también existían online, y hoy reconocemos que el tema del COVID ha probablemente producido algunos cambios acá. Eh, y... El objetivo es preparar a estudiantes para posiciones de entrada en habilidades digitales complejas. Es decir, el que sale de acá se supone que puede ser empleado como programador a un nivel de entrada de programación en una empresa. Eh, están abiertos al público, ¿no? 
Es decir, hay algunos de estos cursos que se hacen para compañías, se llaman in-company, eh, pero eh, eh, hay muchísimos de los que usted simplemente los busca en internet y se inscribe, digamos. ¿no? Entonces, esto es interesante eh, por varias razones. Primero, porque esto no existía antes, eh, con este complejo de características y además con lo que vamos a ver a continuación, con este complejo de, 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 de procesos y de resultados. Eh, y además descubrimos que en el fondo, aunque se les llamaba bootcamps, este era como, si se quiere, parte de una familia, de una familia que buscaba, de, de instituciones nuevas, de escuelas nuevas, que buscaban educar en programación eh, de una manera completamente disruptiva e innovadora. Eh, y bueno, algunas propiamente se pueden llamar bootcamps, otras no propiamente bootcamps, o, o no les gusta en cualquier caso llamarse bootcamps porque son un poco diferentes, pero en todo caso lo que compartían era acercamientos completamente innovadores a la, a, a, al tema de la educación en programación. Eh, ¿Qué los hacía interesantes en las primeras cifras que nosotros empezamos a ver? Y les menciono algunas cosas. Eh, primero, si el estudiante entra, se gradúa a tiempo. Segundo, en la mayor parte, lo más del 80% más, encuentra un empleo bastante rápido y con salarios elevados. Ese, es, por supuesto, corresponde al mercado de los Estados Unidos, el que aparece allí. Eh, y miren esto. De acuerdo con encuestas a empresas en los Estados Unidos, una inmensa mayoría de ellas han contratado egresadas de bootcamps y de los que los han contratado, casi todas lo harían de nuevo. Es decir, consideran que esta persona que ellos contrataron, este trabajador, realmente funcionó para lo que ellos querían. Es más, el 72% declara que el desempeño de egresada de bootcamp es igual al de un graduado de una carrera de ciencias de la computación. Eso es sin contar que un 12% opina que son incluso mejores que los de una carrera de computación. Y nosotros nos metimos en chat rooms y en debates online, y por supuesto hay gente que opina, no, pero esta persona nunca va a estar a nivel de un ingeniero, y hay toda una discusión sobre esto, pero en definitiva la discusión va en esta dirección que les muestro en esta, en esta lámina. Entonces... Bueno, nos pareció que, que aquí estaba pasando algo muy extraño, porque ustedes, les, ustedes dirán, bueno, ¿y de qué otra manera podía ser? O sea, así no es que funcionen las escuelas, y la respuesta es no. Para aquellos de ustedes que se han familiarizado con el tema económico, eh, perdón, con el tema educativo, eh, saben que estos resultados son absolutamente fuera del gráfico en materia de lo que es resultados de la, de, lo, de la educación y de las escuelas. Son absolutamente, excepcionalmente buenos. Eh, y esto, tipo de escuelas, había, proliferó muy rápido. Habían empezado algunas en 2011, unas pocas, un puñado de ellas. Ya para la altura de finales de 2018 había más de 300 alrededor del mundo. Han seguido creciendo. Y... Una cosa que nosotros vimos desde el principio es que había muy poca actividad de bootcamp en América Latina. No es que no había, pero había muy poca. Había una gran preocupación en estos, eh, en estos eh, bootcamps por su impacto, ¿verdad? ¿Qué quiere decir eh, por su impacto? Bueno, que no, no trataban solamente de decir, bueno, aquí estamos, los educamos. No, sino, bueno, ¿y qué pasa una vez que los educamos? Entonces, encontramos bootcamps con sistemas sofisticados de seguimiento eh, a la, lo que necesitaban las empresas para poder estar al día con lo que el mercado necesita, con una inmensa capacidad de o cambiar el currículo o darle a sus estudiantes las herramientas para que ellos se adapten a cambios del mercado, nuevos lenguajes de programación, etc. Eh, y además... Muchos de ellos incluyen servicios incluso de colocación y contacto con los potenciales empleadores para facilitar el hecho de que consigan trabajo. Es decir, el tema de empleabilidad y no solo de educación está mezclado dentro del concepto. Por supuesto, hay una gran preocupación por la calidad. Lo primero que mucha gente dice al escuchar esto, dice, bueno, pero nunca es lo mismo que una universidad. O sea, por Dios, o sea, de alguna manera, este, ¿qué calidad puede tener alguien que se ha formado unos pocos meses, digamos? ¿no? Entonces, digamos que hay una gran preocupación del lado, detectamos nosotros de muchos bootcamps, y por supuesto hay de todo. Igual hay un bootcamp por ahí que está acusado de fraude, etcétera, y como en todas partes. Pero 
hay una, como movimiento, como grupo, hay una gran preocupación por la reputación, por resultados. Entonces hay una documentación de logros. Eh, la industria de bootcamps incluso ha generado formas de seguimiento y control de calidad que se pueden encontrar en internet, que públicamente se dice qué servicios prestan bootcamp, qué tasas de graduación tiene, qué grado de empleabilidad tienen sus egresados. Es decir, a, se le ha tratado, ellos mismos han tratado de dar cierta tra transparencia al tema. Eh, y sobre todo, estos dos temas me parecen excepcionales, los últimos dos que voy a mencionar. Uno, que hay una gran inversión en el modelo educativo. O sea, hay inversiones inmensas en plataformas para educar. Incluso algunas de esas plataformas implican que no hay profesores en el sentido convencional de la palabra, o en lo absoluto. Pero incluso aquellas que tienen profesores eh, tienen plataformas muy elaboradas acerca de cómo eh, facilitar la enseñanza. Eh, esto no es simplemente parar a alguien enfrente de un estudiante y decirle así se programa, sino que hay una gran inversión en pedagogía, en modelo educativo, en instrumentos de aprendizaje y además en educación remedial. Es decir, en la capacidad de adaptarse a distintos tipos de estudiantes y a distintos tipos de eh, situaciones que se pueden presentar con un aspirante. Entonces, si, si alguien entra eh, o quiere entrar, pero no tiene el nivel adecuado, eh, muchas veces se le da una alternativa. Se le dice, bueno, no entraste, pero necesitarías cubrir este material para volverlo a intentar en el futuro. Eh, esto es interesante porque los bootcamps además tienen sistemas de admisión. O sea, no son simplemente puertas abiertas, sino que seleccionan las personas. Eh, y al seleccionarlas, eh, a su vez aprenden acerca de los perfiles que podrían ser más exitosos, todas estas cosas. Y eh, eso es parte, creo yo, de la, de, la, de la magia, si se quiere, que ocurre allí. Entonces, como les decía, tienen una metodología práctica, los instructores en su mayor parte, cuando los hay, porque hay, hay algunos que ni siquiera usan instructores en sentido clásico, eh, son programadores de profesión, no son académicos en sentido clásico. Eh, Utilizan muchos recursos de aprendizaje, una pedagogía orientada a la adaptación de la instrucción a las necesidades del estudiante y tiene sistemas sofisticados de admisión. Entonces, digamos, ustedes dirían, bueno, ¿y, y, qué, y qué de otra manera puede ser de nuevo? ¿no? No, así no se hacen bien las cosas. Dice, bueno, pero yo les voy a mencionar en un minuto lo que es el balance de la discusión acerca de dónde está la educación técnica en América Latina. Y es una educación que, por supuesto, hay de todo. Hay unos institutos mejores que otros, hay cursos mucho de más calidad que otros, pero el balance de lo que se, normalmente se critica en América Latina en la educación para el trabajo, en la educación técnico-profesional, es que falta capacidad de respuesta y adaptación a las necesidades de la industria. No sabe muy bien qué tiene que educar, en qué tiene que educar a la gente para que la industria lo emplee. Hay una rápida obsolescencia del equipo y del contenido curricular y mucha lentitud y dificultades para adaptarlo. Hay métodos de enseñanza anticuados o inadecuados al tipo de estudiantes que están profesando esos cursos. Hay débil rendición de cuentas y transparencia acerca de resultados. Hay débiles mecanismos de aseguramiento de calidad. Y hay un bajo impacto en el destino laboral de los egresados. Es decir, no necesariamente hacen una diferencia en términos de empleabilidad. Entonces, cuando ustedes comparan esto con este otro mundo que yo les acabo de describir, uno dice, bueno, aquí está pasando algo, aquí hay algo que hay que ver más de cerca. Eh, finalmente, y este es el punto último que voy a hacer, eh, nosotros detectamos como les digo, que en América Latina había menos nivel de actividad de bootcamps que, el, que había en otras partes del mundo. Y empezamos a pensar, bueno, hay un rol para la política pública aquí. ¿Por qué? Porque el, el movimiento, llamémoslo así, de bootcamps, es básicamente privado, es iniciativa privada. Si ustedes le preguntan a muchos fundadores de bootcamps, le van a decir que ellos son startups. No necesariamente que son escuelas, ¿no? sino que son startups, son gente que emprendió para innovar y encontrar una manera nueva, completamente disruptiva de hacer algo que no, no existía o que no se estaba haciendo en lo absoluto bien. 
Entonces, mucha de esta energía y de esta innovación que acabamos de ver en esta descripción muy rápida, tiene que ver con que esto fue una respuesta de mercado, una respuesta privada a un problema de las empresas y de la sociedad de escasez de talento digital avanzado. Pero también encontramos países que habían reparado en que a lo mejor el gobierno podía ayudar, a lo mejor podía esto acelerarse si había una clara visión del lado de la política pública de complementar o estimular esto, este esfuerzo privado sin desneutralizarlo o sustituirlo. Y entonces eh, nosotros eh, sostenemos del lado del BID que América Latina debería eh, emprender políticas públicas que fomentaran eh, el, la proliferación de bootcamps eh, eh, y, digamos, innovaciones eh, similares, aunque propiamente no se puedan llamar bootcamps, pero igualmente disruptivas en materia de enseñanza de talento digital en la región. Eh, y encontramos dos modelos, que se los resumo. El que llamamos el modelo startup, que es, tú cuentas con un ecosistema de startups de este tipo, o sea, hay bootcamps allí afuera, aunque no necesariamente en tu país, o no muchos, y tú puedes tratar de atraerlos. En otras palabras, puedes hacer un estímulo por la vía de casi que un programa de licitar, ¿no? este, con fondos públicos, para subsidiar la primera o la segunda generación de eh, formación de programadores, atrayendo desde el exterior, eh, digamos, eh, estos, estos bootcamps, estas empresas innovadoras que están funcionando en otros países. Un país que hizo algo muy parecido a esto, que nos ha sido muy interesante estudiar y contactar la experiencia que ellos han tenido, ha sido Israel, por ejemplo, que no pensarían ustedes que es un país precisamente atrasado en materia de, de talento digital, pero ellos tenían una baja actividad de bootcamps y decidieron estimularla intencionalmente con una política pública de atraer bootcamps del resto del mundo hacia Israel. Y hemos estado discutiendo con varios países de América Latina esta posibilidad y de hecho hay algunos países de América Latina que están empezando a actuar en este tema con o sin el apoyo del BID. Y otra cosa que a falta de otro nombre hemos llamado un modelo de mecenazgo, que es eh, es simplemente decir, no, eh, la formación va a ser completamente gratuita, lo que necesitamos es un sponsor, ¿no? un, un financiador. Ese financiador de este esfuerzo de formación de talento digital puede ser privado, puede ser un millonario, puede ser una corporación, puede ser un consorcio de, de hombres de negocios que piensa que esto es vital y hay que hacerlo, o puede ser una municipalidad, puede ser un gobierno nacional, un gobierno estatal, que decide invertir en uh, algo, algo como esto, siempre que sea también por la vía de no comenzar de cero, sino por la vía de atraer la experiencia y el know-how de gente que está de alguna manera metida en esto y, y sabe cómo es. Con lo que llegamos precisamente al final de mis palabras y al punto donde vamos a estar en este evento y al centro de este evento, y es que vamos a escuchar Ustedes perfectamente pueden, yo les sugiero que se olviden de la mayor parte de lo que yo he dicho, porque yo no puedo compararme en el conocimiento de estos temas con personas que realmente han estado en el centro, digamos, de la acción, que son fundadores o que han hecho estas cosas, y que estoy seguro tendrán muchísimas cosas mucho más interesantes eh, que decir y que, y que enseñarnos, porque tenemos realmente un panel estelar eh, de varios de los más grandes y más interesantes eh, eh, innovaciones en materia de formación de talento digital, que es el que vamos a escuchar ahora. Yo pretendía simplemente darles como un marco para, para, para mostrar por qué esto es interesante, por qué nos parece que es algo a lo que hay que prestarle una gran atención y por qué desde el BID lo estamos trabajando como un tema prioritario en este momento y hemos encontrado buen eco en América Latina eh, desde que lo estamos trabajando. Pero no me extiendo más y eh, eh, bueno, la palabra, Grace. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Juan Carlos. Súper interesante. Bueno, vamos a continuar con este panel estelar. Eh, ¿Cómo se están adaptando los bootcamps de programación en el contexto global? ¿Y cómo pueden apoyar la creación de talento digital para la recuperación económica? Eh, tenemos a la especialista del BIT, Elena Heredero, quien va a ser la moderadora de este panel. Y ella les va a... Eh, 
eh, presentar a los panelistas estelares. Thank you, Grace. I'm switching now to English. Um, so please make sure you have um, the interpretation. Um, I hope, uh, first of all, you are well and healthy. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Thanks for the Pacific Alliance and the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in Medellin and my colleagues at the IDP for inviting me to moderate this fantastic panel of experts. Let me introduce myself uh, very briefly. Um, my name is Elena Heredero. I work at the IDB Lab, which is the innovation laboratory of the IDB Group. Our mandate is to uh, activate innovation for inclusion. And we co-create with different partners. Uh, some of them um, are with us today, like Laboratoria and the Befem. We uh, create with these partners market-based solutions that have a transformative impact in the lives of vulnerable populations. And we do this by leveraging technology and entrepreneurship to have social impact at scale. My areas of expertise are very much related to the boot camps, as I work in education, human capital development, the skills for the 21st century, and the future of workers. So um, let me tell you how the panel is going to work. Um, the objective of this webinar, as um, Alejandro said at the beginning, is to help build the Pacific Alliance digital talent roadmap with the public and private sector. We have many guests in the audience from the public, private, academic, nonprofit sector that have a lot of questions about how to do this. And we have these panelists that have the knowledge and the experience. So from now on, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I will try to do my best to incorporate them into the discussion, okay? So the floor is now open uh, to receive your suggestions. And uh, let's start then with our esteemed uh, panelists, with Oliver, with um, Boris and Najib. They are going to introduce themselves. So let's give the word first to Boris. Why don't you start introducing yourself and your bootcamp? Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Elena, and, and uh, thanks to, to everyone to be here uh, and to invite uh, me at this event. So, so I'm Boris, I'm the CEO and the, one of the co-founders of a company called Le Wagon, or Le Wagon, like the, the Americans say. And uh, so we are a coding school, a global coding school that was created uh, seven years ago. And our mission is to change the life of our students and change the career of our students through immersive boot camps in web development and in data science. So we do operate our bootcamps in uh, intensive mode and during full-time uh, two months programs or uh, for in a, with a bit uh, longer format during six months part-time for people who have a job and cannot uh, quit their jobs to do the full-time uh, bootcamps. And essentially, people who join our programs after they graduate will either join a company as a software de developer, as a data scientist or in a technical role or they will start a freelance, uh, a freelance career. It's a big trend. There are more and more uh, actually people working in freelance and that raised a lot of questions on the, the, how you measure uh, the outcomes of boot camps. And I'm sure we, we might speak about that during this, uh, this call. So either working uh, in a tech position, launching a tech freelancer career or launching a startup as an entrepreneur because there are also lots of uh, uh, possibilities for people who learn software develop, development to actually launch their own startup. And we have loads of alumni who've launched their startups after our boot camps. So we've been doing that. We were the, the first boot camp in Europe originally. So we launched uh, it uh, seven years ago. And now we, we graduate more than 3,000 graduates per year. Uh, we launched the first campus in Latin America four years ago. It was in San Paolo. And now we have uh, three campuses in Brazil, we are in Buenos Aires, we're in Mexico. And I hope that uh, thanks to initiatives like Talento Digital, we'll be able also to, uh, to develop uh, our boot camps in Chile. Uh, 
And so actually, uh, that makes us one of the, I mean, biggest global player. And I think it's interesting because we did that without funding. We, we, we started to raise funds this year, but we developed the company ourselves without any funding for seven years and reaching a level of being in 40 campus worldwide, training 3,000 graduates, but maintaining a very high quality. So if you look at, uh, there are two platforms today who reference the, the boot camps, coding boot camps. It's a switchup.org and course report. And on both student reviews platform, it's a bit like a trip advisor, but for boot camps, we are ranked first on, on, on both these platforms. And because we really put a lot of uh, effort to iterate on our curriculums, uh, I, I think that uh, Juan Carlos mentioned that we build uh, own software and it's at the heart of the, our model, how we manage to scale. So we have 20 developers and we really uh, built a software that helps us scale the program, maintaining the same standard everywhere. And above all, I think that's the, the key because as, as uh, you, you were, uh, it was described by Juan Carlos, bootcamps are very intensive. It's a very high return on investment format and the risk, you can do one session, two sessions, but how do you maintain also uh, a very low turnover of your teachers? How do you maintain top teachers, experts in their field for a long time? And uh, for that, we've developed our way of doing it. it was quite different from competitors because we really built a community of freelance teachers and lots of them are alumni that did the bootcamp four years ago or five years ago. And today we have more than 1,500 freelance teachers. And this combination of modern softwares that we develop with our 20 developers and a community of freelance teachers that teach in a very flexible way and with an immediate feedback loop uh, when they are teaching, I think it's one of the recipe that makes us one of, uh, I mean, right now, uh, the, the, globest, the um, biggest global player on, on this, uh, this uh, pace. Uh, and I look forward to, to discuss a bit uh, all the, the details of this model and how you can scale it, but maintaining a very high uh, standard, basically. That's, that was fantastic, Boris. Uh, incredible growth of uh, Le Wagon around the world and also the importance that you place on, on quality, of maintaining quality, uh, in spite of um, you know, being in so many different countries and, and regions. Let's hear now from Olivier, because you have a very special and unique um, uh, model uh, that is unconventional within the unconventionality of boot camps. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alina. Thank you all for being here today. So uh, I'm Olivier. I'm the head of pedagogy of an ICT school in higher education that is called 42, just like the number. And uh, uh, it's a school that have been created first seven years ago in Paris. And it's an initiative from a French billionaire uh, who is named, uh, who is called uh, Xavier Niel. He's owning one of the four telecom company in France. And he was facing um, a big problem. He was looking for ICT talent and he saw that a while ago, it was very difficult to hire uh, real people with real ICT talent. And uh, at some point, he also did realize that uh, some uh, people in its own teams uh, can have uh, such kind of talent, but can also be completely out of public education. Uh, someone who did drop out of public education at 16 years old, lived from very small selling jobs, and uh, then uh, completely randomly uh, was part of a web developer um, a small program. And he did realize that poor people in poor suburbs can also have such kind of uh, very uh, interesting uh, ICT talent. So he decided to create his school, 42, with in mind two strong um, uh, elements at first. He wanted a school completely free for the students and a school that does not require any um, previous degree. The idea here is to try to detect talent regardless the school background and regardless the social background of the, of the students. To do this, uh, we have a very wide open communication and we tell everyone, just try our selection process. It's easy, it starts with online tests, uh, just try it. Probably at some point you will realize it's not for you. 
probably at some point you will also realize that it was just for fun, but you actually like it. So we want also to reveal people who did not expect that ICT could be an interesting path and an interesting career for them. So our selection process starts with online tests. It's just small games, but that for us reveal uh, if uh, the applicant has the same logic uh, to be able to code. And also um, uh, then after that, we have the second part of the selection process. It's something called la piscine. It's a French word for swimming pool. It's a four weeks long immersion process. And during these four weeks, we have the applicants that are tasting if they do like coding and if they do like the peer learning pedagogy that we do apply. In France and in now in 33 other campuses all around the world, 42 is famous for its peer learning model. The idea is uh, to have uh, something that is uh, completely hands-on uh, practice uh, and uh, with no teacher, no lecture, no online MOOC and students are facing software development challenges. They need to create piece of software with absolutely no idea, no recipe about how they can do uh, that. And uh, to do so, they will need to search and collect information, uh, usually make some tests to figure out uh, what information is true, false, maybe irrelevant, maybe obsolete. And then after that, to discuss and talk and debate with all the other students uh, in the community to uh, try to uh, also find new ideas, new hypotheses, and finally to complete a project inside the curriculum. We design a curriculum that is working step by step, meaning that every next project is just a little bit more difficult than the previous one. And every student can fail a project and try the same project again. So uh, it's uh, a place where every student progress at its own pace and make its own choices. Um, 42 have been designed uh, for two kinds of uh, students. I would say first uh, students who want to go very quickly on the labor market. It's possible to complete the first part of the curriculum in almost just one year and then to have the minimum set of skills to start a career. But we also want to offer other students who have more time in front of them uh, the ability to uh, spend more time doing more complex projects and more advanced projects in classic ICT domain like artificial intelligence, database, security, uh, gaming uh, industry, uh, functional programming, mobile development, uh, web development, and so on. And uh, after that, uh, they can reach, of course, more advanced and more interesting job uh, if they stay longer inside the, the curriculum. So I would say that we are halfway between a big boot camp of uh, uh, one year uh, of the curriculum and uh, more something close like an engineer school with a, a more classic uh, ICT school uh, with a, a curriculum that can last uh, almost five years uh, after the, um, uh, after, during, for the curriculum. Uh, we also, of course, have, uh, just like uh, Boris, we have very good results about employment uh, at the end of the, of the curriculum because, uh, of course, the labor market is in deep need of ICT, uh, ICT professionals. Uh, we do have a lot of job offers and internship uh, offers. Today, 42 in Paris, it's 4,000 students. And all around the world in the 33 campuses, it's more than 10,000 uh, students. Right now, we do not have a lot of campus in Latin America, just one in Sao Paulo. But uh, I know that we already uh, take some contacts to uh, open in uh, other uh, countries in the, in the area. And I think I'm uh, done for this small presentation about 42. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, it's really fascinating the selection mechanism that, that you use and the immense popularity that it has, um, you know, in France and in other countries. I know that uh, a lot of people are now posting uh, their questions on the chat. Thank you so much for that. 
Let me just uh, give the word to Najib Abdallah. He's going also to present uh, Make It Real, and then we're going to jump in into the questions. So, Najib, go ahead, please. Elena, thanks for inviting us and uh, having me here to share our experience with you. Let me share with you a little bit of our, um, about our story. Make It Real was born in 2014 when a group of entrepreneurs and leaders of software development communities in Latin America joined efforts to solve a specific problem. We found that hundreds of jobs openings were left and filled because employers couldn't find a suitable candidate for those job openings. As what Juan Carlos was saying at the beginning, by in, in 2014, they identified that 1.2 million developers will be required by 2025. And, and there was a real gap between the skills the companies needed and the skills the candidates actually had. Make It Real was created by software engineers for software engineers. Led by its founder, Herman Escobar, a Colombian entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience writing code. In 2014, Make It Real set a mission for Latin America, and it was to, and it is to transform lives through education. We know, as we are software engineers, we know not only how hard it is to learn how to become a great software developer, but also what it takes to develop a successful career in the software industry from Latin America. From 2014 until today, we have tested different curriculum methodologies and learning formats to create the training that better fits the student professional goals and the company's job opening requirements. Understanding the little details and dynamics of the Latin American culture this is really important because it's not the same. Uh, the habits and the culture related about uh, learning if you're teaching in the US, in Europe, or in Latin America. We work closely with companies to understand their needs and with the students to understand what and make sure that we help them achieve their professional goals. We have developed our own platforms, our own uh, methodology, and right now we have three different programs. We teach software engineering with uh, two different uh, formats, one immersive, full-time, uh, that you don't have to pay until after you get a job, uh, and the other one part-time uh, for people that is exploring if they want to become a software developer. And the third one, uh, we teach data science for people that uh, want to learn how to make decisions based on data and implementing uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, as um, the previous panelists were saying, we're really, really careful with the quality and the outcome. And our measure of success is that our al alumni get higher and giving access to all these alumni to our network of partners that companies that need software developers uh, allows us to always have the most updated curriculum and the best methodologies to fit what is required in the market. Super. Thank you so much, Najib. So now that we know a little bit of uh, what you do and, uh, you know, your track record, we had quite a few questions regarding the issue of certifications and um, uh, the interactions of boot camps with universities. And I think it would be very useful for the Pacific Alliance to know what is the role of the private sector in ensuring quality? And what is the role of the government in ensuring quality? So let's take this question first, and then perhaps we can talk about the relationship with universities. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, can, I can tell you a bit my, my point on that. So uh, 
uh, originally boot camps have appeared because like people were I mean, were looking for skills that get them jobs and not for a certificate. That's the uh, you know the at at the DNA of boot camps. Uh, we, we, people that join the boot camps uh, want to launch their company, find a job, and don't care that much about, uh, uh, in some way, a, a sheet of paper. Also, uh, now that the market is more mature, we can see. So, of course, like the, the boot camps themselves, they started to develop their own methodology on how they uh, assess their KPIs for student satisfaction or uh, outcomes, and there are also like initiative for in, in the US, there is a standard called CIIR, which uh, a bunch of bootcamps that started to develop standards on how to, uh, for transparent outcomes. So there are lots of, uh, of things that have been developed um, in terms of certification. In our case, what we do have is local certification country by country. So for instance, we do have a certification in France that is recognized as a as like uh, four years uh, of after uh, high school as a, an equivalent diploma in some way. We are certified in Germany and, and uh, thanks to the certification, the German government can finance uh, our boot camps for unemployed people. And we do have actually more than 200 people unemployed doing our boot camps uh, through uh, funding by the government because we are certified in Germany. But for now, we, I mean, we, there is no kind of global certification uh, that we do have because every local regulation uh, asks us for different criteria. So for instance, in France, we need to, to pass an exam, an additional one, even if we do have some tests uh, throughout the curriculum of our bootcamp. So, so we have automated tests of the exercise of the students. We do code reviews. We do lots of things to ensure that the students are progressing in the bootcamps. But nevertheless, the French government will ask for a specific exam at the end that verifies some criteria to check some boxes in some way in terms of skills. And we had to develop this additional exam that we didn't have at the beginning to get the French certification. So I guess for us, uh, it's kind of certification is uh, it's, it's tricky because there is no, for us, global solution. It's country by country. Uh, and when we do partner with uni, maybe we'll speak about that after that, in, when we do that, it's more the, 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 the school that brings their knowledge of certification because schools are, I mean, are, it's, a, it's more like a, they are used to, to, to this world of uh, certification. It's something that's quite new for, for boot camps, I think. Olivier. Well, uh, on our side, uh, um, we are definitely relying on um, uh, information and uh, from, from the company and from the private sector. Um, it means that uh, it's because our students, our alumni uh, do have uh, such kind of job and such kind of salary uh, inside their, um, uh, at the beginning of the career. Uh, it is definitely something that um, is part of the image and of the um, uh, reputation of, uh, of 42, at least in France. But indeed in other countries, uh, sometimes it's easier or more complicated to get an official certificate Right now in France, I think it's not for uh, uh, an immediate uh, demand uh, on our side uh, to ask for an official uh, recognition and homologation from the uh, French uh, public, uh, public state. Uh, but we do have uh, some of our students who are already employed by some ministry, uh, for example, the Navy Ministry or uh, uh, also uh, the Ministry of Defense. Uh, so it's not, um, it looks like it's not a, a real issue to not have a, a strong uh, and official uh, homologation here uh, in France. Also, um, in, uh, in France, uh, it have been, the school has been created by someone who is very famous and well known uh, among the, all the French tech uh, ecosystem. So it's easier for our students in Paris to uh, uh, be trusted by uh, all this uh, new startup uh, ecosystem. Uh, Xavier Niel uh, not only funded uh, for the school 42, but it also did uh, founded uh, the biggest incubator of the world with more than 1,000 startups. It's called Station F. It's also in Paris. And uh, so there is 
no real um, uh, demand from all this ecosystem uh, for an official degree from uh, from our students. Uh, but in different countries, uh, sometimes when it's uh, funded by the government, because we do have some campuses that are funded by individuals, just like in France, by uh, companies, like in Russia, for example, but also by uh, government. Uh, and uh, uh, it's logic in this kind of countries to have um, an official homologation from the uh, from the uh, from the public government because it's a public government who is uh, uh, creating the local uh, the local campus. Um, we have been looking uh, for a while now in uh, also all these uh, uh, badge uh, systems that could be perhaps more uh, international here. And uh, we know that there is a Mozilla Foundation who is doing this, uh, and it's probably more, more cross countries from outside because it's very difficult to have some uh, official validation from uh, one government uh, regarding a certificate uh, validated by another government or another country. So um, we probably uh, try also to uh, reach this more skill oriented um, uh, vision and visibility for our students when they are uh, uh, when they are alumni and we already have some description all the curriculum is today based on 17 different skills uh, sometimes it does not ring a bell to the uh, companies but sometimes it make uh, companies understand uh, what kind of skills uh, are uh, do have our students at the end of the curriculum Najib, why don't you tell us a little bit about the relationship between Make It Real and the universities? Um, how, how is that relationship, um, you know, working out in, in your case? Yeah, thanks, Elena. Uh, I, we see universities, we are complementary and also an alternative to universities. But before getting uh, in this topic, I want to add something to just uh, what uh, Olivier and Boris said, and it's that it's, it's the flexibility you need to constantly update a curriculum in a boot camp to fit the needs of the market, make it a really um, clear constraint or harder to have a system that you can homologate around the world in terms of certifications, even in one country, because you need a lot of flexibility. So this is, this is an interesting challenge we all have to create this, this, this system. And in addition to that, the results or the best uh, metric or KPI, if you want, um, to measure uh, the results is that people is get, getting hired and companies are, are asking for more developers, more alumni, um, like the ones they already hired. So that's, that's, that's one KPI, uh, key performance indicator, uh, to start building around that. We also have uh, our, our own um, gamification and batches system in our own platforms. And it works for uh, motivation and engagement. Uh, but face to the market, um, job placement as the best uh, KPI. Okay. Regarding um, uh, universities, we're uh, complementary to universities um, the, in this way. Uh, we receive a lot of people with bachelor's degree that maybe they want to change their career and actually with the pandemic, it happens more than before because there were people getting uh, fired from their traditional jobs or industries and they found um, software development as an alternative to uh, start a new career and uh, get hired by uh, international companies and getting really good paying jobs. So uh, if you already have a degree, you can uh, just enroll in the bootcamp. And for instance, you can study data science to, make how to, to, to learn how to make decisions based on data. And it doesn't mean that you're going to change your career. If you're a lawyer, if you work in the healthcare, uh, if you uh, uh, work in finance, 
these skills are going to help you make better decisions, take the best out of uh, machine learning, right? And you already studied something in a university, so it's complementary too. And as an alternative, if you don't want to study a five-year uh, program or four-year program, uh, a traditional uh, undergraduate program, um, you can get ready to be hired in a much shorter time, right? Uh, I see those two phases, complementary to and an alternative to. Perfect. And you mentioned the word of the pandemic, um, and uh, we've, we've been talking about different trends in the market. Boris mentioned like the rise of uh, freelancing, for instance, as, as a possible uh, you know, like job opportunities in, in that area. So let's take a quick poll with, with the three of you and tell me um, how much the pandemic has affected your programs. Uh, too much? Uh, I mean, you have continued to grow, nothing at all, it, it stays the same, or you've been negatively affected by, by the pandemic? A quick poll, just tell me positive, negative, the same. Yeah, for us, in terms of demand, uh, it has, the demand has grown because more and more people have realized that uh, the future is not certain, that they need to upskill the, the, you know, uh, they need to upskill in technology. So it has, there, there are more and more people who also, who, under this climate of uncertainty, who decide that now is the, the good time to, to future-proof themselves in some way and to spend time learning uh, these skills. So in terms of demand, it's, uh, it's uh, positive for us. Has it been easy for you, Boris, to adapt to virtual learning? Yeah, very, very easy because uh, as I, I told you, we have a, first we have a platform. So we had something and we just needed a, a bit of automation on the Zoom, uh, like just plugging Zoom or Slack to, to even improve the automation uh, for teachers and students to communicate. But I think boot camps, I mean, there are lots of advantage in a boot camp that allows for remote teaching. And here, for me, it's very important. In education, we mix everything. We say online or on-site, but it's not a matter of on-site on or online. You can do online self-paced without teacher, and you can do online synchronous with teachers answering your, your question uh, live. And so it's really important to, to use the, the right words, otherwise we get quickly lost uh, in education. So for us, boot camps, uh, it's, for me, uh, uh, the perfect uh, uh, like education program to run in remote because first of the nature of what we are teaching, because as we are teaching software development or data science, by nature, it's something that can be done on the computer. It's not like, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, pottery, like pottery or whatever, ceramics or, and so because of that, uh, we, we can have the students like do the exercise and, and collaborate from their laptop at home. Uh, the second thing is the format. As it's synchronous and very intensive, you don't lose track of the students. There is no such thing as, uh, I don't know, bachelor program of uh, three years where all the schools had this problem because they were losing track and they didn't know about the engagement of their students and what the students are doing when they are at home. Whether we monitor every minute the progress of every of our students worldwide on any challenge because everything is integrated thanks uh, of, the, of what we're teaching and students can ask questions whenever they're stuck. So it was easy for us to, to switch to remote teaching um, so I, I think it's working well. We have like the same satisfaction from the students than before. The only thing that we are losing, it's, uh, I think that's something that we, you can see if you read the student reviews from bootcamps, it's also a lot about the community, a bit like an MBA. You build yourself a community of other people, tech learners that you will keep learning with after you graduate, a network of, uh, that will give you job opportunities that's as important as the career service that the bootcamp will provide. And it's harder to create this sense of group dynamic and community uh, in remote. And for, in this sense, the same challenge we have than any school in the world uh, during COVID. Uh, and and the, for the teachers also, it's a bit more exhausting because su supervising a class from uh, your laptop, it's, uh, it's not the same as you know, seeing the, the face of the student. So of course, I, I'm, I don't say that uh, everything's gonna stay remote and that's the best. I think it's working well. But I, I, I mean, I look forward that you know we can just uh, continue to do uh, in-person education like we like to do. Yes, yes. This social distancing is killing us. Um, go ahead, Olivier. 
Um, well, same for us, we uh, are using a, a platform um, and uh, because our students have this freedom of pace, everything is already organized so they can progress when they want, they can work when they want, they do organize themselves and everything is available online. We just had to open some firewalls uh, to allow them to work from uh, from home. Um, we also had a, a, a at least, uh, maybe not an increasing, but at least always uh, the same number of applicants also uh, in our selection process. Um, uh, but what we saw is that um, working remotely is not so easy for everyone. Not everyone is ready for this. Our age average is uh, uh, 22 years old, uh, so it's not very far from high school and uh, definitely, at least in France, it's not in high school that students know, uh, learn how to collaborate and how students uh, learn to organize themselves and to be autonomous and to be able to work remotely. So that's why we do have uh, huge um, campuses with uh, uh, very big computer rooms and we ask usually our students to work on site on campus because for most of them we know that they are not ready to start collaborating remotely from scratch uh, because it's not part of their classic previous uh, education. So we definitely saw um, uh, a big split in our population, uh, a little bit more than half of our population who already uh, is autonomous, uh, enough autono uh, has enough autonomy to be able to start working remotely at almost the same pace as usual. And at the same time, uh, we uh, need to engage some specific support, which is unusual for us, for all the other students who are not ready for working remotely. And uh, we had a lot of online events. Uh, uh, we had way more um, uh, Zoom and meetings uh, online to communicate with them, to exchange with them, to give them more flexibility uh, to, uh, uh, for them to uh, try to uh, raise uh, any motivation level that can be uh, interesting uh, for them. So it was um, a little bit more difficult on this part for us. The, uh, all the technical part, all the online uh, services were already here, so it was completely easy for us, but uh, the uh, collaboration uh, part is a little bit more complicated for a, a little bit less than half of our population. And they already express the, uh, the will to come back as soon as possible uh, uh, on campus because we still have some campuses that are under lockdown, for example, in Brazil or for example, in Morocco, not all the campuses are uh, reopened so far. And a lot of students are waiting uh, for uh, uh, being able to get back to the campus again. Go ahead, Najib, tell us about uh, Make It Real. Uh, yeah, to, to summarize a little bit uh, the topic about the pandemic, uh, the demand has absolutely increased. I mean, there are more people requesting uh, to be enrolled uh, in Make It Real programs, per se something. I think it's the same as uh, um, the other panelists uh, were sharing with us. But there are uh, two additional uh, really important points uh, related to the pandemic. And uh, one is that there are more competitors right now. There are uh, uh, people, uh, including also the universities, that are launching uh, platforms with content that it's really different. Um, there are different formats, right? But there are more players in the market uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, the situation made all the competitors or all the players in the education field to create new formats to teach. The other, the other important point about the pandemic is get very talented people working at companies like uh, uh, Uber, Google, etc. big players in the tech industry uh, around the world. They were uh, firing people and these people was, were, 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 they were looking for jobs, right? So even if the demand uh, for the boot camps increased, there were also more talented people looking for jobs, competing with the alumni uh, from the boot camps. So th this is a, a very uh, interesting phenomenon that it's uh, uh, occurring right now. But in brief, the demand has increased, yes. 
I would just add something. I think you, you mentioned uh, in your question, Elena, freelance, and also we, Olivier has this, uh, uh, this interesting uh, insight on the soft skills and the collaboration and how you, you keep that and you develop that from your students in a remote environment. So on our side, what's interesting is uh, we have like, a, we, 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 in the admission process, we validate the soft skills. So we, in some way, we'll develop that throughout the camp, but we make sure that the students have the soft skills. And what we discovered running the program uh, remote is in the final project weeks of the bootcamp. So it's the three fi final weeks uh, where students will develop a software in a team and put it online or develop a data science project uh, or a machine learning model and, and deploy it uh, in production in a team. That when we were doing, I mean, by doing that remotely, uh, students are forced to use project management tools, things that we were teaching in the campus before, but that students were not necessarily using because at the end they were all in the same room and uh, sometimes skipping the process. And the fact of teaching remotely make, make better like uh, uh, freelance workers or people that are a bit more at ease with how you collaborate on a software project uh, in remote. And I think that that's key because also in Latin America, I know that there are lots of big agencies like Wallox in, in Buenos Aires that uh, are building big hubs of talents that work for companies in the US or, and this, developing this capacity uh, to work uh, from uh, your, your laptop at home uh, collaborating on projects. I think it's also something that's, that's key and that's uh, not just teaching the skills, but teaching the methodologies and uh, the soft skills in order to be working uh, in, this, in this environment. Yes, one of the questions that we're getting is regarding the skills that you teach. So can you tell us like briefly how much do you dedicate to digital skills or social emotional skills or any other skills that, that you provide? Um, well, right now we have uh, uh, 17 skills uh, in the 42 curriculum and uh, uh, 12 of them are technical skills and five of them are uh, soft skills. Um, and um, I, I, I will share with you uh, uh, a kind of secret here. We are actually lying to our students and uh, we are telling them that they are developing their uh, IT skills, but uh, that's definitely not the goal here. Uh, we want them to uh, develop some adaptation skills, uh, so problem solving skills, collaboration, organization, creativity, uh, self-learning. Uh, we know that in five years, in 10 years, uh, all the technical skills will probably be obsolete and it joined uh, uh, one of the points that already mentioned Naib uh, previously. Uh, it's a difficulty to uh, have uh, uh, students uh, always up to date and also to have a uh, boot camps program always up to date across all the different uh, different countries and uh, we think that uh, with our peer learning model our students are always in front of uh, a situation where they need to develop such kind of soft skills they need to uh, find their own uh, way their own solution in front of in front of a problem and for us it's uh, a key for a sustainable career we want to develop an agile state of mind for uh, for our students and uh, in seeing this way they will be able to always adapt during all their career and uh, not need a, a new training in in 10 years or in 15 years because the technology has evolved and inside our curriculum we also did choose to um, have only a low focus on specific technologies on specific brands on uh, specific programming language uh, in many um, in many projects in many challenges our students have the choice for example their first web challenges uh, the students uh, need to choose uh, between among several um, uh, web uh, classic web frameworks like Ruby on Rails, like uh, Symfony and PHP, like uh, Django and Python. And uh, it's just up to them. And uh, maybe uh, we will be able to add more choice uh, when a new web framework will be uh, interesting for them. Uh, and I think it's always the case, actually. Um, so we try to... Um, develop this uh, always this capability of being uh, 
to always adapt to uh, what's coming next or even to be part of uh, a pioneer team and uh, uh, explore or create something uh, something new uh, so we need to give our students this uh, this agile state of mind so basically learning to learn is one of the yeah. key skills that, that you provide uh, your students we have uh, less than uh, 15 minutes left and uh, I would like to also uh, touch upon some of the questions that we've been getting through the chat regarding the, the context of Latin America and how boot camps can uh, develop and flourish in, in Latin America. So what would be your top recommendations, uh, top three recommendations? to the Pacific Alliance <laughs> on how to uh, help uh, develop boot camps and digital talent in their countries. Okay. Uh, if you allow, I, I, I can start. Um, as Olivier and Boris were saying, not only the technical skills are important, uh, for instance, in Make It Real, um, we start working on soft skills from the beginning. And another skill that it's maybe not important if you're um, uh, running a bootcamp in the US or in some countries in Europe, and it's English, right? And I'm um, just merging this question with another one from the chat uh, that is asking from Facultad de Arquitectura, is, saying, is asking if there is any weaknesses uh, in the um, participants from Latin America in these bootcamps. Um, you need to understand really well the habits of people in your country and the culture related to how they prefer to learn, right? It's very different. There are boot camps that work really well, like self-paced in other countries. But in Latin America, we have tested, we, we, we have been in the market for around six years. We have tested different models and having uh, a mentor guiding you and having synchronous sessions is really important for Latin American students, right? And I don't, I don't think uh, that they have weaknesses. Um, I think that you need to support them in different ways, understanding the culture. Some of them have imposter syndrome, and it's that they think that they are not good enough to work in a global company. But if you work with them the right way, not only the technical side that it's really important, but the soft skills, the emotional skills and the English skills, they'll get the really best job that match the goals they have uh, professionally, right? Um, and regarding the, the, the technologies you teach, uh, that's why we work really close with, with companies and we have a really a uh, robust network of uh, uh, allies uh, to identify constantly what they need. As a developer, and if there, there are developers in the chat uh, or people wanting to become a developer, don't focus too much on uh, if I learn this framework or this uh, programming language, that's important. But the foundations, how to solve problems, how to make abstractions, how to propose solutions to problems, that's what it's going to be valued the most uh, for people hiring you. And that's uh, one important point that make it real work on, additional to the soft skills. So in brief, uh, don't focus only on tech skills. And secondly, understand the culture and the context of people that it's enrolling in your programs, because it's not the same if you have someone that, that we have these different cases, someone from Kipdo, one of the poorest regions in Colombia that went from Kipdo to Medellin. Uh, uh, he graduated from the bootcamp. Now he works for Oth Zero, a unicorn from Argentina, from the US. We're not changing wildlife, we're changing family's life, but his contest and the way he learned is different from the person that just graduated from a top university in Colombia or Mexico and just want to change in their career path, right? That's my, that's my, my point on that. Thanks. Super good recommendations. 
just, just to answer to your question, Elena, so I, I think I shared uh, what uh, both uh, Olivier and Naive have told, like uh, learning how to learn, don't focus too much on the technology. Of course, there are some concepts. I mean, if you study software development, you need to know how, uh, what the relational database uh, is and how it's uh, architectured and, uh, I don't know, how you work uh, with versioning systems. So there are lots of things that you need to know, of course, but there are lots of things uh, where if you know the concepts and if you have your ideas clear and above all, if you have articulated all this by developing a product in a team, putting that online, presenting that in a pitch in English, that's how we, we teach the soft skills by actually having all the students present a final project online on a URL and uh, uh, recorded on YouTube. And I think that's the, the best way to kind of wrap all, the, all the, the skills. And at the end, if I go to, as a junior graduate from a bootcamp to an employer, to a CTO in an interview, and I'm the first candidate that say, I know Node.js or whatever, I list technologies and I, I, might, I will not be taken by the, for the job. And I, if I say, well, I know the basic concept of software development, I've developed a project from uh, A to Z and here it is, I can show you the, this project and I'm humble and ready to learn new technologies, I will definitely bet on the second candidate. So that's the kind of candidates we want to train uh, in our boot camps. To get back on your question, what to do in, to, in order to promote boot camps in Latin America. I think it's I, I more have uh, you know, like insights on what not to do. And I think uh, the question we have on, it's a characteristic. The question we have was on certification or on the list of skills. And I think that here we should be careful not to reproduce some framework that at the end were applied to traditional education uh, organization before and not put too, too much uh, uh, rigidity, keep a, a, a lean way of developing. As Juan Carlos was telling us, like the, the demand is, is huge. We were speaking about millions and the bootcamp is training 40 students per class. So there are rooms for different players. So instead of building up regulation, like listing, you know, having the checkbox syndrome of, okay, how to list all the technologies, how to list all the KPIs, the quality control that uh, each bootcamp need to fulfill um, to create kind of new standards or certificates. Of course, that will come. But let's create that in a, in a collaborative and in a meaningful way. And instead, more like make more due diligence, like discuss with experts on very what matters. It's like, how do you ensure that your teachers are, are the best? But not uh, in your way. I mean, it can be several ways of how you, 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 you have like the best instructors. How do you update your curriculum? What's your way of doing that? Show me that. And then based on that, select some, some uh, trusted partners that have been validated by people who know and that find that it's, a, it's the right educational approach, it makes sense, it's sustainable. And, and then based on that, try to build up the standards. So that would be kind of my, I think that, the, the, of course, I may, I may be a bit uh, idealistic sometimes, but I think that uh, there are lots of good players and a bootcamp needs iteration, needs experience. So uh, of course, we need to also give the chance of new local players, but spend more time speaking with people, building the curriculum, teachers, and uh, don't come up with too much, you know, like uh, constraints on you know, checkboxes. Because checkboxes will come, but maybe that's not what we need right now. So flexibility within some rules, um, but uh, really allow for the, the experimentation and the innovation to continue to happen, right? I think boot camps. I mean, they deserve not that many funding. I mean, I mean, El Wagon is half the price of a bootcamp in the US. So in a sense, it's two months. It's a great opportunity to test things and iterate. We are not speaking about, you know, long curriculum where you will see the outcomes in two years. And of course, you need to do more due diligence. More. So I think it's, a good, it's good to multiply initiatives of more like a UFO of digital education like 42 that are is a great model that's uh, proved to work elsewhere shorter training, uh, like Naive's bootcamps or, or Le Wagon, or, and just you know, give, give more space to different models and, and spend more time discussing with the teams before building to, like, the, the, next, the new standards. Boris, thank you so much, Olivier. I don't know if you have one recommendation and we have to close the panel because um, we have another um, speaker. My, my main recommendation was actually one of the major points of Boris, it was diversity. I think uh, uh, instead of uh, having a unique um, uh, education model for public education uh, to uh, allow uh, 
um, more diversity in boot camps or maybe also university or whatever uh, it's probably the, the key and uh, i do not completely agree with naive uh, about uh, the cultural difference i think that um, we are not uh, completely uh, we are completely out of the french culture uh, when building 42 in paris so i think there is also space for uh, things and uh, learning models that are completely out of uh, cultural uh, classics uh, in uh, in every country so far we did not touch anything in the curriculum for our campus in seoul or in tokyo uh, maybe in the connection with the labor market yes we need to make some adaptation some change internships are dealt differently but the learning model itself is exactly the same. So I think there is also space for such kind of difference and it can attract a specific population. And uh, as Boris said, uh, it's uh, uh, 40 or 100 or 200 uh, in one school. It's uh, the same amount of students in, in another uh, learning center. And we definitely need a very huge amount of um, uh, ICT professional in all the countries. So there is a place for uh, plenty of place for many players, yes. Perfect, thank you very much to the three of you for bringing all your knowledge and expertise. Um, we have to close the panel and I'm going to give the word to Grace, right? Right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for this wonderful panel. Thank you, Oliver, Boris, Nayib. Merci, muchísimas gracias por el panel. Eh, vamos a pedirle a la señora Angélica Romero que encienda su cámara y su, um, su audio. Eh, ella va a dar las palabras de cierre. La señora Angélica Romero es la directora general de Asuntos Económicos Internacionales de la Subsecretaría de Relaciones Económicas Internacionales del Ministerio de Relaciones exteriores de Chile. Eh, muy buenos días, buenas tardes, eh, 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 digamos también porque sé que hay diferentes usos horarios, así que en algunos lados buenos días, buenas tardes, en realidad eh, me sumé y estuve escuchando muy atentamente, eh, quisiera felicitar a, a Boris, Olivier y a Nayib por, por, por digamos, el, el trabajo que están desarrollando y particularmente agradecerles por darnos un espacio de su tiempo y contarnos, compartir con eh, la Alianza del Pacífico eh, cómo ustedes están abordando los bootcamps, cómo estas son herramientas que son útiles para avanzar eh, en el talento, en las brechas eh, digitales que, que existen y digamos acelerar eh, la creación de, de talento digital. Eh, comentarles que, bueno, eh, desde la Alianza del Pacífico, y ya lo tiene que haber dicho eh, mi colega Alejandro Buinic, estamos trabajando en una hoja de ruta eh, de talento digital y además en un mercado regional digital. Y creo que ustedes en su alocución han, han destacado elementos que son súper relevantes, por ejemplo, el tema de la diversidad y de la flexibilidad. ¿No es cierto? Eh, eh, el tema de la innovación requiere de, de no solamente de conocimiento y de creatividad, sino que también de esa diversi diversidad y de esa flexibilidad que ustedes conversaban para poder adaptarse a las realidades, para poder responder a las necesidades que existen en los diferentes mercados, con las diferentes eh, empresas, eh, con los diferentes productos que se van generando, no estamos hablando ya de los productos, eh, digamos, que originalmente hablamos como de eh, eventualmente eh, productos como manzanas o muebles, sino que estamos hablando también de productos digitales que han ido avanzando y que se han incluso posicionado en, en esta nueva etapa que, que estamos viviendo, digamos, eh, que es tan difícil con, con la pandemia. Y por lo tanto, eh, esta, estos conceptos que ustedes planteaban son súper relevantes y quiero detenerme en, 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 dos, en, en tres elementos que creo que son, eh, que, que estuve anotando. Uno que decía Boris aprendiendo a aprender, eh, digamos, la, 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 la herramienta eh, no, no, no tiene que ver solamente con el conocimiento, sino que también cómo yo aprendo y cómo aprendo esas destrezas blandas que ustedes decían. Y quiero mencionar algo que, que también decían del inglés, ¿no es cierto? Y aquí la Alianza del Pacífico no solamente está trabajando en una hoja de ruta de talento digital, sino que también, y, y, del, y el mercado regional digital, sino que hace pocas semanas atrás tuve el, eh, también la oportunidad de participar en el, en el lanzamiento, digamos, en el trabajo que estamos haciendo con la red de inglés de la Alianza del Pacífico, porque nosotros sabemos que también 
el inglés es una brecha que tenemos que tratar de eh, abordar y de ir mejorando poco a poco, y por lo tanto estamos trabajando también en, en ese punto eh, los, cuatro, los cuatro países. Decirles que sin duda eh, que, que el bootcamp es una herramienta, por lo que lo he escuchado, yo estaba muy atenta, uno sabe muy poquito y, y por, eh, hay que ver que uno entiende mucho mejor, digamos, el, el tema de las certificaciones, de cómo podemos avanzar, sin duda que han, ha, ha, ha sido una herramienta que, que ha avanzado mucho, que por supuesto tiene su, su, todavía que responder a ciertos desafíos, claramente eh, esta conversación que tiene que tener de, de, de la, del emprendimiento de la educación más formal en la universidad, no sé, más tradicional, por decirlo, y eh, esta nueva herramienta eh, sin duda tienen un gran espacio de, de, de convergencia eh, y de, 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 de espacios comunes para, para poder avanzar. Así que simplemente agradecerles a Olivier, a, Bor a Boris, a Nayib por darnos los ejemplos. Eh, eh, nosotros desde la Alianza vamos a seguir impulsando, quisiera agradecer a todos los que han participado y particularmente a quienes han coordinado esta actividad, al Banco Interamericano del Desarrollo, al Centro de la Cuarta Revolución Industrial, al gobierno de Colombia, que también particularmente nos apoyó mucho en esta actividad, eh, y a los demás países también de la Alianza del Pacífico. Así que muchísimas gracias por estar ahí, quedarse hasta el final y escuchar eh, tan buenos ejemplos de Bootcamp. Muchísimas gracias. Nosotros damos concluido el evento del día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias a todos los panelistas, a todos los participantes por haber eh, compartido el día de hoy. Eh, gracias. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Bye bye. Gracias.